So guys, welcome to the second edition of GS analysis and mains evaluation. So we'll be talking about uh, from question number 11 to question number 20 and we'll be finishing our paper 1 discussion to na today. So look at question number 11. With a brief background of quality of urban life in India, introduce the objectives and strategy of the smart city program. <coughs> okay. So basically, you have to create a linkage between the background and the quality of urban life in India with the smart city program. Dekhiye, koi bhi national scheme ya flagship, flagship scheme kabhi bhi uh, ijat ki jati hai, to obviously the spirit behind that scheme is the social deficiency or the political deficiency or the deficiencies in the economic structure of the country. So what could be the background for smart city program, what was the need to come out with a program like this, okay. So pehle to aap jab, uh, when you start answering a question like this, you have to give a brief background of the quality of urban life. Now what is the quality of urban life in India, let's, let's look at that. The urban areas are increasingly burdened with population explosion, they are stretched to their limits and not just that they are brimming with population to the extent they, that they are bursting at their ski, seams. Traffic seems to be in a disarray all the time. Sanitation facilities are not available to all. Also availability of electricity on a 24 hour basis is only extended to better sections of the society and the poor do not have equal benefits. At the same time, women's safety issues have become, have come to the fore, safety of women and, and children is essential because it has become a nightmare especially during the odd hours. Also the working hours of people have become erratic, that also means that people are moving around in the city at odd hours, therefore the city infrastructure should be devised in a manner that it complements the urban landscape. Now what are the other aspects and what is the kind of uh, background that we are talking about. See quality of urban life is determined on a few metrics. What are those metrics? You can talk about air pollution, you can talk about noise levels, you can talk about potable drinking water and its availability, you can talk about prevalence of diseases, you can also talk about facilities for the disabled and you can also talk about how certain schemes for resettlement and rehabilitation of the slum dwellers have been conceived. And in the backdrop of this, there is a dire need for a flagship scheme like a smart city. Because the kind of urban infrastructure that we have today, it is proving inadequate to handle and manage so many people all at once. See administration at the end of the day is the maximum benefit of maximum people, right? It is almost impossible to cater to the demands and needs and the basic requisites of all the people and all the city dwellers. But at the same time, it is the responsibility of the administration and the country at large or the government at large to provide basic services and amenities in an efficient manner, in a timely fashion and in a fair manner to all the city dwellers. And that is where, that is the genesis of this smart city program. So this is the background of the quality of urban life. The urban infrastructure is crumbling day in and day out. The traffic situation is getting worse and worse by the day and also uh, the air quality levels are falling down. We have just seen the despicable quality or the kind of air pollution that the capital of this country, Delhi is witnessing. All of this included would make it almost mandatory upon the city administration or the ruling government to devise a plan of action to revamp, rehaul and reform the complete urban infrastructure. So, ye hai background, aap in the body of your answer in the first 5 to 6 lines, you can enunciate these details, you can talk about that and once you are done with that, you can also incorporate a little bit of data from census 2011, which says that 31 percent of the population of this country resides in the urban areas, but its contribution to GDP is to the tune of 63 percent. So you can understand the kind of importance that is uh, that the urban population holds in the demography of this country, right. So 
also urban areas are expected to house 40 percent of India's population and contribute 75 percent of India's GDP by 2030. Now, in the backdrop of all, of all this, we require a clearly devised strategy. Now, how is this strategy? Because the question also explicitly talks about the objectives and strategy of the smart city program. So, the objectives of the smart city program would include core infrastructure elements like adequate water supply, assured electricity supply, sanitation including solid waste management, efficient urban mobility and public transport, affordable housing especially for the poor, the robust IT connectivity and digitization, good governance coupled with e-governance practices, sustainable environment, safety and security of citizens, women, children and the elderly. Obviously, health and education also form the pillar of the smart city program and therefore is listed as one of the core infrastructure elements that requires immediate attention. Now, we have conceived this program with regards 100 cities over a period of 5 years. Obviously, if this is such a magnum opus of Indian polity, then it would require a humongous effort and a clearly devised strategy, a sophisticated, sophisticatedly driven strategy. What is the strategy? The strategy plans a pan-city initiative in which at least one smart solution is applied citywide. Now that one smart solution could pertain to public transport as regards so many metro projects which are coming up in many cities like Nagpur and Ahmedabad and Chennai and Mumbai. Also this could mean uh, developing apps for the safety of children, for safety of women, right? So, a good virtual interface or a good digital platform could go a long way in securing a smart city in the near future. Developing areas step by step, okay, that is also one of the strategies. Some pilot projects needs, need to be initiated first and the success and or the failure of those pilot projects should be taken into account while implementing and initiating smart city strategy elsewhere in the country. Retrofitting, redevelopment and greenfield projects become integral to this strategy. Greenfield projects are the, are indispensable to sustainable development and therefore more focus needs to be diverted here. So this is, this is in brief the strategy which is to be incorporated in conceiving and development of the smart city program. So, now uh, you, would, you would be thinking where to get such content and data. See the thing is that if you keep on reading your newspapers on a daily basis, if there is complete synthesis of your current affairs and if you do your back end research and if you uh, sniff out data which is, recent, uh, which is relevant for your answers like census data, I do not think it is, uh, it is that difficult to crack a question like this. Already Make in India, Stand Up India, Smart, uh, Start Up India, Gang, Namami Gange, Smart City Program have all been in news for a very long period of time and it need not be mentioned that these things will definitely find a mention in your question paper also. Therefore, regular newspaper reading along with back end research is advised to all the serious UPSC aspirants. This would not require a lot of time and energy, but you need to be a little more disciplined than what you already are. Okay, so moving along, let us look at question number 12. What is the basis of regionalism? Is it that unequal distribution of benefits of development on regional basis eventually promotes regionalism? Substantiate your answer. Now, they are asking you something, so this, therefore this becomes an opinion based questions. Be very careful guys when you are, talk, when you are going to write answers for opinion based questions because you have to back your opinions with empirical evidence and facts and data. Therefore, I would suggest that such questions need to be tackled in a short shot manner wherein you are not fudging any data, where you are not manufacturing data on the spot. Also, since this is an opinion based question, you are supposed to take a balanced approach and also give a vision for the future. Obviously, Extreme line of thinking is ill advised in questions like these, but at the same time, a little bit of standpoint should emanate out of your answers. Some highlights should be visible to the examiner also. So, what is the basis of regionalism? The basis of regionalism in India is basically diversity of this country. 
we all come from different parts of the country and these different parts of the country are distinct from each other in terms of the language, in terms of the food, in terms of the dialect that is used, in terms of the clothing that is initiated, in terms of um, the, the classical literature that one consumes, also in terms of uh, religion because a lot of uh, states in the country are either dominated by Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or Sikhs or even Christians in some cases. So such, ma such multitude of religions, castes, uh, race, ethnicities, language, all these contribute to the growing tide of regionalism in India. Now this is basically the basis of regionalism in India. Let us look at the next part of the answer is that the unequal distribution of benefits of development on regional basis eventually promotes regionalism. Unequal distribution of benefits, iska kya matlab hai that social equity or economic equity is suffering. Why is because there are some certain regional biases, because certain states are poor, certain states are manufacturing powerhouses and certain states are saddled with a lot of other problems or bestowed with a lot of other advantages. Aisi sthiti mein ye ho jata hai ki unequal distribution of benefits of development hume dekhne ko milta hai on regional basis. Aap Green Revolution ka hi example pakad lijiye. Green Revolution was limited to North Indian states and North West Indian states like Punjab, Haryana, North Western Uttar Pradesh. Whereas states like Urisa, West Bengal, uh, or even northeastern states were kept out of this process. The benefits of green revolution did not particularly filter down or percolate down to the uh, central states or western states like Gujarat and Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh also down south. So obviously benefits were, benefits were enjoyed by people from particular states. Now the question is, is it that unequal distribution of benefits of development on regional basis eventually promotes regionalism? Yes, that could be true because when people know that belonging to a particular region actually is beneficial to them, they will obviously want regionalism as a concept to be alive and kicking. Obviously, we have also seen the sons of the soil doctrine being perpetuated in states like Maharashtra because Maharashtra is a manufacturing state and a developed state. Now here where migrants come from other cities, they end up taking up jobs which actually should go to the local people. But sometimes local people do not have the necessary skill sets or even not just that, sometimes the don't, local people are just not willing to stretch or to work hard. Now in that situation obviously those jobs will be taken up by people who are ready to work hard and who have the requisite skill sets. In the line of this, again regional biases will crop up is because local people will not appreciate this sudden invasion by immigrants from other states. So this unequal distribution of benefits, it will yes eventually promote regionalism. Now, answer ka part na ho, but from understanding purposes, it is very essential. GST ki baat kar lijiye. What is GST going to do? GST is, is going to diversify manufacturing. Jab hum economy mein dekhenge to hum padhenge ki kaise GST is going to diversify manufacturing centers. Because GST after all is an end tax or a terminal tax. So obviously manufacturing will become diversified and therefore it will not be concentrated in the states of Gujarat, Maharashtra and Karnataka only. It will also appear in Uttar Pradesh and also in poor states like Bihar and West Bengal as well. In that situation, there will be no need for migration and since there will be no need for migration, people will find jobs in their own areas and hence because of the cooperative federalist structure of GST and the nature of uh, 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 co uh, competitive nature of GST, it will promote again some sort of regionalism but based on social equity and economic equity. Abhi tak humne jo dekha wo social inequity tha aur economic inequity tha. Let's hope and suppose that GST plays a functional role in diversifying manufacturing. So, we have seen that India is a country with a, India is a federal country with a unitary bias. Okay? Or you can vice versa also say that India is a 
uh, unitary country with a federal bias. Depends on your perspective and the kind of thoughts you apply. But at the end of the day, if, if, if we have a central leadership and we have state leadership also, there has to be a complete synthesis and therefore growth and development should go and hand in hand both at the central level as well at the state level. Therefore, regionalism has got to do away, regionalism has to be shunted out if we, need, if we want this uh, process, process of development to be fast tracked. Isme aapko, agar aapka example, aapko answer substantiate karna, you can use the example of Green Revolution. You can also use the example of Sons of the Soil Doctrine as I have mentioned. Okay. So, these are detrimental to the progress of the country and also promote regionalism which is not always necessarily good. Okay. Now, moving along to the next question, discuss the concept of air mass and explain its role in microclimatic changes. Guys, straight away lifted from NCRT. If you are, you have, if you have honored your NCRTs properly, and if you continue to do so in the future, you would be in a good position to write a hard hitting and almost a near perfect answer for a question like this. So, therefore, discuss the concept of air mass doesn't really mean, uh, doesn't really pose a lot of challenge to you. Also, understand one thing that if you draw a diagram or if you illustrate with a pictorial representation. It will go a long way in saving time for you as well and saving the energy of the examiner because then the examiner does not have to go through the text. Just looking at the diagram, the examiner would decide or would judge your levels of uh, conceptual clarity. So, I would advise you to go through the concept of air mass and then write it down and jot it down in your notebooks. Likewise, also, uh, also make a note for other concepts so that you are ready for typical geography based questions. Now, the next question is the Himalayas are highly prone to landslides. Okay. Discuss the causes and suggest suitable measures of mitigation. We have seen that landslides are If you ask me, my mind wanders back to 2014 Uttarakhand floods. Alaknanda and Bhagirathi when they overpart the entire landscape when they flooded the entire region. Agar aapko yaad hoga to. A colossal damage of life and property was experienced and what we saw was there was, it was actually uh, augmented or it was actually exacerbated by the landslides. Ab ye landslides Himalayas mein kyu dekhne mein aa rahe hai? Ye landslides Himalayas mein isle dekhne mein aa rahe hai because Himalayas <coughs> have a lot of thriving religious tourism. Uttarakhand mein agar aap dekhenge to, Rishikwesh hai, Haridwar hai, yahaan pe religious tourism kaafi ho raha hai. At the same time, uh, traditional Himalayan resorts like Shimla, Manali, Masuri, Nainital have seen an unprecedented rise in the tourist activity in the last decade. So, what we see is a sprawling network of resorts, a sprawling network of hill resorts and other extracurricular activities. We have seen that there is a spurt in trekking activity also. So, obviously, this would mean a lot of construction activity. And since there is a lot of construction activity going on, it leads to deforestation. Deforestation will eventually lead to soil deterioration because the topsoil will become loose, right? Now, this is anybody, anybody's guess that deforestation will eventually lead to soil erosion because the topsoil becomes loose. Or yehi hua hai Himachal mein, yehi humne dekha hai Himachal mein, itne pichle ek decade mein. Isi liye you, you can see that, see a lot of roads are also built. Sometimes even roads are built by border, uh, border roads organization, BRO. When you are cutting through the hills and we are, when you are paving hills out of that, obviously you are compromising on the ecology and its health. When you do that, the topsoil becomes loose and therefore it rolls down in the form of landslides. Ye landslides honge kab jab bahut zyada barish hogi. In the aftermath of global warming, what we have seen is cloud bursts have become quite frequent. So, jab cloud burst hota hai, tab there is heavy downpour, there is torrential downpour and when there is torrential downpour, this topsoil is, once it is saturated with water, it comes down as a rolling mass of soil, a big blob of soil. It takes down everything in its way and therefore the Himalayas have become highly prone to landslides. 
you could also include the problem of overgrazing because the pastoralists generally take their cattle or their sheep or their herds to the higher slopes and these higher grazing is conducted in an, in an unmitigated fashion in, with gay abandon on these Himalayan slopes. What happens is again the soil is degraded because the topsoil becomes loose because it becomes barren after the grazing activity and there are no grazing lands uh, as we have seen with countries like Australia and US and Canada also. There are big ranches where grazing areas are regulated. You have such no regulation in India. So what happens is grazing also becomes a big cause of to topsoil becoming loose and resulting into landslides. So three pillars are grazing ke baare mein lik sakte hai, tourism and religious tourism ke baare mein lik sakte hai, global warming ki wajay se cloud burst ho raha hai, uske baare mein lik sakte hai. Also, measure, what are the measures of mitigation? Obviously, afforestation is one of the major measures of mitigation because afforestation will not only, uh, is not only a remedial measure but at the same time afforestation is responsible for carbon sequestration. Now when there is, when you develop your carbon sequestration fa facilities, what happens is the effect, the harmful effects of global warming can at least be slowed down, right. So since India is a high carbon emitter in the world, afforestation will not only help in uh, mitigating landslides but at the same time help us tackle the menace of global warming. If you write this in your answer, your answer becomes well thought out and you will end up getting more marks, needless to mention that. So these are some of the method measures of mitigation. You could say that trekking activities and other religious tourism activities should be regulated. Tourists should be made aware of their responsibilities to, towards their environment. Also strict regulation and strict laws should be enforced in the hilly areas or hilly slopes where rampant construction activities undergo, undergoing. So such illegal construction should be stopped, okay. So eco-friendly resorts or eco-tourism should be promoted. Once you talk about eco-tourism, the examiner would definitely know that the aspirant has a complete understanding and a good grip on such topics. So this becomes a fairly easy question. I don't think it requires any further anal analysis. If you have gone through your newspapers perfectly and if you have written answers on these lines, I am sure it will get you, it will fetch you good marks. Now moving along, we look at question number 15. So the question number 15 is about the effective management of land and water resources will drastically reduce the human miseries. So land and water resources ke management ki baat chal rahi hai. Obviously land and water are the two biggest sources on which the economy rests. Aur hum ye dekha, aur very recently we have seen that water resources are depleting. Ab water resources ki baat kare, to what is the biggest source of fresh water after glaciers? That would be ground water. So there is rampant ground water extraction. Why? Why suddenly there is rampant groundwater extraction is because subsidies are given, electricity subsidies when they are given, basically they are used by the rich farmers who can afford pump sets and bore wells. And then they will extract huge amounts of groundwater for agricultural purposes and usage, right? Obviously that will lead to the depletion of groundwater. The water tables will go down. Also, Excessive use of fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides and weedicides would contaminate the topsoil and would filter down into the groundwater tables. That also contaminates the groundwater. This has to be taken into uh, consideration while writing an answer. So also rainwater harvesting methods are not implemented properly. It is time that we go back to our traditional rainwater harvesting methods so that water resources can be conserved and also replenished. Therefore, the management of water becomes extremely crucial to the urban and rural, rural landscape. It, will, it says that it will drastically reduce the human miseries. Obviously, because portable drinking water is not available, obviously because uh, water that is available for other uses is also not, uh, not available in abundance. 
we have seen drought like situation in marathwada region in maharashtra had there been robust and healthy rainwater harvesting systems over there it would have it would have slowed down that ghastly impact that it had on the people right so we need to adopt climate smart agricultural techniques we, there it is time now that we need to judiciously use our water resources net metering of water resources right so water usage charges should be levied and therefore uh, it is essential that you mention all of this in your answer water usage charges and everything if you mention in your answer your answer becomes all encapsulating <coughs> now let's talk about effective management of land dekhiye grazing ke bare mein humne baat ki so that makes uh, land a vital resource and a very vulnerable resource also at the same time fallow land bahut dekhi ja rahi hai because of rampant use of fertilizers of fertilizers ki jo ratio honi chahiye nitrogen phosphate and potassium npk that should be in the ratio of 4 is to 2 is to 1 but what we have seen is ki urea based fertilizers jo nitrogen based hote पर सब्सिडी वहां पे ज्यादा दी जा रही है सो फार्मर्स ऑब्वियसली आर ऑप्टिंग फॉर यूरिया बेस्ड फर्टिलाइजर्स एंड व्हाट दैट मींस इज देयर इज एक्सेस ऑफ नाइट्रोजन इन द सोइल दैट डिक्रीजेस द सोइल फर्टिलिटी एंड द रीसाइक्लिंग ऑफ अदर न्यूट्रिएंट्स बिकम्स ऑलमोस्ट इंपॉसिबल टुडे इफ यू लुक एट द रेशियो द प्रीवेलिंग रेशियोस ऑफ दीस थ्री फर्टिलाइजर्स एनपीके दे आर इन द रेशियो ऑफ 8.3 इज टू 2 इज टू 1 whereas the desired level should be 4 is to 2 is to 1 now this clearly demonstrates that nitrogen has become excessive it could also lead to it, nitrogen could also filter down into our food chain that could also contaminate our vegetables and therefore could have devastating and drastic impacts on vegetable uh, on humans also and every animal which consumes that right it could also lead to blue baby syndrome it could also lead to endemic uh, diseases like goiter okay so effective management of land resources should be there fallow land should be replenished people should uh, farmer should basically adopt mixed cropping they can also adopt crop rotation right and la landfills should be demarcated there should be a landfill should be regulated monitored and supervised by the civic administration these landfills should be fairly isolated from other parts of lands right so this is what constitutes the effective management of land resources i am sure there are some other points also which i have skipped because those points are fairly regular in nature what i am trying to tell you here guys is basically that your answer should be aligned in a manner that it it reflects the continuity in the question itself agar aap dekhenge to is saal unhone 12.5 marks ka question jo pucha hai usko for our better understanding kai jagah pe unhone उसको डिवाइड भी किया है फोर एंड हाफ प्लस एट एज यू कैन सी फोर एंड हाफ प्लस एट एज यू कैन सी सो देर आर देर इज सेपरेट एलोकेशन फॉर सब पार्ट ऑफ द्वेश्चन एंड देर फॉर ऑल पार्ट ऑफ द्वेश्चन नीड टू बी थरली डायसेक्टेड एंड इन्वेस्टिगेटेड वाइल यूर राइटिंग यूर आंसर एंड ट्रस्ट मी गाइज टू हंड्रेड वर्ड इज अ गुड इनफ लिमिट टू राइट यूर आंसर यू नीड नॉट फील वॉरिड दैट द वर्ड लिमिट इज प्रिटी लो और प्रिटी हाई you can if you think that the answer is getting too lengthy you can stick to a point wise format if you think the answer is uh, if the content that you have is not much you can stick to the paragraph format and also explain the body of the answer in a more elaborate fashion okay so moving on we look at we we'll look at question number 16 now major cities of india are becoming vulnerable to flood conditions discuss this is something which has appeared in the newspapers for such a long period in time now there must have been more than 100 articles which must have uh, been printed in the newspapers in the last one year just on this topic on the topic of major cities becoming vulnerable as regards la flood conditions are concerned now why are cities becoming vulnerable to flood conditions pehli baat to water carrying capacity of the rivers is going down now why is the water carrying capacity of the rivers going down very simply put that there is a lot of sedimentation a lot of load is dispatched into the rivers right soil erosion ki wajah se kafi zyada sediment dispatch ho jata hai rivers ke andar at the same time if a river is flowing through to uh, uh, through the urban areas we we actually dispose of so many things into the river without thinking twice about it so this actually 
makes sure this actually leads to a situation wherein the water carrying capacity of the river is less and in such times what happens is when there is a flood condition the water flows out of its stated river bank and inundates the city right so therefore cities are becoming vulnerable to flood conditions and not just that sewage treatment plants and affluents flow with uh, rampantly into the city uh, into the rivers and into the lakes and into the other water bodies that also contaminates these water bodies right but contamination is not an issue the issue is sedimentation the issue is the declining water uh, river water carrying capacity at the same time in major cities we see urbanization and cementing of roads what is, what do you mean how do you relate cementing of roads with flood conditions cementing of roads ensures that the water drains off water drains away and therefore water does not percolate down and since the water does not percolate down when the roads are paved with cement it will obviously have a drastic impact on the sewage treatment or drainage system of the cities and most of the sewage treatment and drainage systems of the cities in india are outdated have have not been repaired have not been retrofitted with modern technology and therefore are ill suited to handle such big amount of water this volume of water has to be handled by using sophisticated means of uh, sewage treatment uh, technologies but those are either not available to the civic administration or even if they are available to the civic administration they are not employed effectively at the same time you can also talk about urbanization you can also talk about rampant construction activity that is going on in the cities you can also talk about flood conditions developed because of flash floods and cloud bursts cloud burst tab hoga jab global war dekhiye cloud burst is a natural phenomena but at the same time cloud burst is a kind of phenomena which can be aggravated by global warming because global warming means more precipitation more precipit more precipitation means saturation with water so the moisture carrying capacity of the clouds goes down and once that goes down they thunder down with a lot of with a big volume of water so obviously carbon emissions and fossil fuel emissions play a big role in the ecological health of a city and therefore you don't you don't have to you can't fail to mention these things also in your answer so moving along we have reached to question number 17 in what way micro watershed development projects help in water conservation in drought prone areas and semi arid regions of india abhi yahan pe they have already stated very explicitly that they want you to talk about drought prone areas and semi arid areas of india so drought prone areas or semi arid regions agar hai to you have to look at the so basically you have to look at the water availability in that region if the obviously the water availability in that region is going to be low so replenishment of water in terms of wells and all is going to be not there so what are these micro water uh, watershed development projects these are the projects that are taken up at the community level or the panchayat level or at the city level so this is a community led initiative such community led initiatives should be backed up with funding from the state government and they should employ the traditional rainwater harvesting techniques every state has its own traditional rainwater harvesting technique also if irrigation is undertaken for agriculture then judicious and uh, judicious practices like drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation should be employed in the management of such uh, projects also terrace farming contour bunding and mixed cropping as well as crop rotation should be employed climate smart agriculture which requires less water which requires less electricity should be undertaken in such areas also the central pillar of micro watershed development projects should be community development it should be a community led initiative as i have mentioned before why is simply because community led initiatives bring in more effort bring in more clarity and it's a multi stakeholder platform wherein all people are responsible when responsibility is distributed amongst the inhabitants of the region there is better management of such projects so you can take such measures you can write about such measures your answer becomes complete when you mention all these technicalities in your 
आंसर सो अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन इज पॉप्ड अप क्वेश्चन नंबर 18 साउथ चाइना सी हैज अज्यूम ग्रेट जियोपॉलिटिकल सिग्निफिकेंस इन द प्रेजेंट कॉन्टेक्स्ट कमेंट ओके कहा पूछा ये क्वेश्चन डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ की नेचुरल रिसोर्सेस अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड क्वेश्चन क्या है साउथ चाइना सी ऑब्वियसली दिस बिलोंग्स टू द रियल ऑफ इंटरनेशनल रिलेशंस एंड फॉरेन पॉलिसी नाउ एन एवरेज यूपीएससी एस्पिरेंट वुड बी फ्लमक्स्ड वुड बी कंप्लीटली बैफल्ड टू सी अ क्वेश्चन लाइक दिस इन पेपर 1 ऑल ऑफ अस वुड हैव एक्सपेक्टेड अ क्वेश्चन लाइक दिस टू हैव अपीयर्ड इन पेपर 2 बट what we see is that south china sea finds a mention in paper 1 now why would a topic like this find mention in paper 1 is because there is a sovereignty fight for sovereignty or fight for there is a territorial dispute raging in south china sea there is a pocket of islands and these pockets of islands called as paracelans partly are rich in a natural resource which would be rare earth metals yahan pe yahan pe it's a trap the moment you see south china sea as a upsc aspirant you would start writing everything from the international perspective you would start writing from the strategic perspective you should but you should hold your horses you should take a deep breath when you talk about when you read questions and you should see kind the kind of wording that has been used here it has assumed great geopolitical significance in the pre present context now why geopolitical significance there are two pillars to this answer the presence of rare earth metals in south china sea see almost everything com com is composed of rare earth metals today isn't it right from the pen that you use and the smartphone that you use everything has a component of rare earth metal in going into it now china is a export oriented economy it is a manufacturing powerhouse of the globe and therefore china feel china is in a desperate situation to express and reassert its sovereignty rights in the this area because its manufacturing capacity and its manufacturing efficiency is directly related to accessibility to rare earth metals and therefore other countries are also claiming their sovereignty rights in this area to the extent that even japan is mobilizing mobilizing its navy in the same area now since the global demand is going down and since china is experiencing for the first time single digit growth there's china is experiencing some fall in its export revenues obviously it feels even more desperate to rein control or rein supremacy in this region and therefore we can see a lot of chinese aggression in this region so this is first pillar the uh, to be in possession of the resources which give us rare earth metals or polymetallic sulfides okay also the second point or the second pillar of this answer would go back to the maritime capabilities and navigational routes now this area obviously talks about हेलो 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 या सो द सेकंड पिलर ऑफ योर आंसर वुड हैव मैरिटाइम कैपेबिलिटीज टॉक अबाउट मैरिटाइम कैपेबिलिटीज टॉक अबाउट नेविगेशनल रूट्स टॉक अबाउट गेनिंग कंट्रोल ओवर दिस एरियाज एंड सी लेन्स ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन व्हिच मेक्स मूवमेंट ऑफ गुड्स फास्टर therefore any country which has a good control over these sea lanes of communication would obviously have an upper hand as regards trade is concerned 
okay so these are the two pillars of your answer don't get swayed don't get trapped and don't get sucked into the international relations aspect don't write too much about how there is a strategic advantage and how china is undermining the ruling of international seabed authority and international court of justice those are not the types type of uh, points that you should incorporate especially if the question is asked in gs paper 1 so yahan pe upsc aapko test kar raha hai aapka presence of mind knowledge to sabke paas hai magar aapka presence of mind kitna hai kaun sa kaun sa point kaha likhna hai is something that one has to decide and when you decide that you should be extra careful therefore reading questions and re reading -re -re questions is quite essential now coming back to question number 19 present an account of the indus water treaty and examine its e e ecological economic and uh, e and political implications in the context of changing bilateral relations context kya hai changing bilateral relations कॉन्टेक्स किसके साथ चेंज हो रहा है चाइना के साथ और पाकिस्तान के साथ हुआ आर आर इमीजिएट नेबर इन दस वाटर ट्रीटी किसके साथ हुआ है पाकिस्तान के साथ हुआ है कब हुआ था 1960 में ये डील किसने ब्रोकर किया था वर्ल्ड बैंक ने ये कुछ फैक्ट्स आपको पता होने चाहिए अब इन दस वाटर ट्रीटी न्यूज में क्यों था ऑब्वियसली आफ्टर द सर्जिकल स्ट्राइक दैट वी कंडक्टेड वॉट हैपन्ड इज पाकिस्तान ऑल्सो डिसाइडेड टू रिटालिएट बैक बट बिफोर दैट we had an attack on at pathan court and also an attack in uri right that prompted india to take an action against pakistan and military action is not the only alternative that a country can take against the other country india is an upper riparian country what do you mean by an upper riparian country that india is the source country of many rivers which flow into pakistan so that means pakistan a lower riparian country right so since pakistan is a lower riparian country india has an upper hand in this sector okay water is an essential element of every country's economy i don't have to mention that rivers are the bloodline and they play a major role in any economy and its growth now since india is an upper riparian country the river courses could be changed or could be blocked and they could we could uh, that could have an adverse impact on the pakistani ecology and pakistani economy right at the same time guys consider that ravi bias and jhelum under the indus water treaty are completely given to india whereas satluj chenab and indus that uh, these rivers are allocated to pakistan but india is still allowed to use 30% of these rivers india has not used 30% of these rivers out of sheer goodwill so now since a diplomatic situation has arisen wherein india can uh, take a revenge on pakistan or where india can call a war on pakistan which is fondly called as a water water war by our media we can start exploiting the resources or the water resources of satluj chenab and indus by being within the confines of the indus water treaty बिकॉज थर्टी परसेंट तो हमको दिया ही है जो हमने आज तक यूज किया नहीं तो हम थोड़ी कह रहे हैं कि हम उससे ज्यादा यूज करेंगे मगर अगर हम ऐसा करते हैं तो इसके इफेक्ट क्या हो सकते हैं इसके कुछ इफेक्ट जो होंगे वो इकोलॉजिकल भी होंगे इसके कुछ इफेक्ट इकोनॉमिक भी होंगे और पॉलिटिकल भी होंगे सबसे पहली बात तो पॉलिटिकल इम्प्लीकेशन क्या होंगे दैट पाकिस्तान वुड क्राइव फाउल वेन पाकिस्तान क्राइव फाउल अदर पार्टीज विल कम टू इट्स रेस्क्यू लाइक चाइना और हमने देखा जब हम हमने वाटर कोर्सेस चेंज करने की बात की या किशन गंगा प्रोजेक्ट के लिए रिवर वाटर हमने डाइवर्ट करने की या यूज करने की बात की तो चाइना एक्चुअली स्टार्टेड चेंजिंग चाइना एक्चुअली स्टार्टेड स्टॉपिंग द फ्लो ऑफ ब्रह्मपुत्रा इनटू इंडिया सो वॉट एवर बायोलैटर रिलेशन विद पाकिस्तान वॉट एवर प्रॉब्लम पाकिस्तान विल डायरेक्ट विल है डेमोन्स्ट्रेटेड and will probably emanate from the eastern sector to china so that is one of the political implication what could be the economic implication obviously that see water is the foremost and the uh, most important resource for hydroelectric power projects and power drives every economy so if india starts using the waters for kishan ganga project what will happen is indian economy will uh, at least the local economy will flourish 
but at the same time the pakistan economy or river banks will be drastically affected so that is one of the economic significance of uh, violating the indus water treaty okay now indus water treaty hai isiliye water wars india or pakistan ke beech mein nahi ho rahe that is the utility of this treaty and therefore world bank took an initiative to broker a deal between india and pakistan इकोलॉजिकल प्रॉब्लम्स क्या हो सकते हैं आपने तो कह दिया कि हम वाटर स्टॉप कर देंगे बिकॉज वी आर एन अपर राइपेरियन कंट्री बट आप ये भी तो सोचिए कि जब वेन यू स्टॉप द वॉटर ऑफ अ रिवर दैट विल इनडेट योर ओन कंट्री द वैल्यू ऑफ कश्मीर विल बी इनडेटेड विद द वॉटर ऑफ झेलम सो वॉट विल इवेंचुअली हैपन इज दैट सिंस आर आर ओन लैंड इज इनडेटेड विद वॉटर इट विल अफेक्ट द एग्रीकल्चरल इकोनॉमी इन अ बिग वे इट विल अफेक्ट द फ्लोरा एंड फोना ऑल्सो इन अ बिग वे राइट so you cannot disturb the ecological balance that has been restored and ecological balance has been kept in mind while drafting the provisions of indus water treaty so obviously it is needless to say that it has its own utility and it will have huge repercussions in the ecological realms in the political realms and also in the economical realms and not just that even china might take a responsive action against india so india has to be very careful as regards violating the indus water treaty or even using the waters of these two these three rivers under uh, what is allowed within the framework of this treaty because india is a soft power and has demonstrated it time and again that we are a soft power and just out of sheer goodwill will not use the already allocated waters of these three rivers so abhi abhi tak itna goodwill bana ke rakha hai to aage bhi bana ke rakhna जरूरी है क्योंकि इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान हैव सीन थ्री टू फोर वॉर्स नाउ एंड इन स्पाइट ऑफ द वॉर्स बीइंग देयर इट इज कमेंडेबल दैट इट हैज नॉट बीन रिफ्लेक्टेड इन द वाटर वॉर्स दैट कुड हैव बीन देयर राइट सो क्रेडिट गोज टू बोथ इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान फॉर नॉट फॉर्मेंटिंग एनी हेटरेड एटलीस्ट इन द रियाम ऑफ कंडक्टिंग एनी वॉटर वॉर्स ओके सो दिस इज समथिंग दैट नीड्स अ लॉट ऑफ कंटेक्चुअल एंड कंसेप्चुअल अंडरस्टैंडिंग only then you can attempt such questions theek hai again this question could have diverted a lot of people but ecological imbalance ke bare mein agar aap likh dete hain to aapka question hard hitting ban jata hai now the last question which is about enumerate the problems and prospects of inland water transport in india Inland water transport in India के बारे में जब आप बात करेंगे तो आपको national waterways के बारे में बात करना चाहिए आपको भागलपुर बिहार से लेके तो आसाम तक जो हम पहला नेशनल वाटर वे बना रहे हैं उसके बारे में बात करनी चाहिए और आपको ये बात करनी चाहिए दैट द कनेक्टिविटी ऑफ दीज इन लैंड वाटर वेज शुड बी एक्सटेंसिव विद द पोर्ट्स ऑफ इंडिया बट द पोर्ट्स ऑन द ईस्टर्न कोस्ट एंड द वेस्टर्न कोस्ट आर नॉट एडिक्वेटली कनेक्टेड विद द इन लैंड वाटर वेज पहली बात तो ये डेवलप ही नहीं हुए डेवलप इसलिए नहीं हो पा रहे बिकॉज ऑफ प्रेजेंस ऑफ अ लॉट ऑफ बराजेज एंड डैम्स ओके अब बराजिंग करेंगे और डैम करेंगे तो आपको ड्रेजिंग एक्टिविटी बहुत करना पड़ेगा ड्रेजिंग करेंगे तो प्रॉब्लम ये आ सकता है कि यू विल डिस्टर्ब द मरीन बायोडिवर्सिटी देखिए वी हैव वी हैव अजेटिक डॉल्फिन इन द विक्रमशिला सेंचुरी इन बिहार ओके चंबल रिवर से ये जाता है सो so, ऐसे कई सारे की स्टोन स्पीशीज है विच विल बी अफेक्टेड initially uh, uh, fishes from west bengal used to travel up to actually himalayas the sardines or himalayas mein bhi sardines mila karti thi and it used to be a part of the cuisine culture in himalayas but after the construction of faraka barrage these fishes obviously cannot cross those channels and therefore their population is coming down rapidly because mating and breeding bhi properly nahi ho pa raha hai so you can enumerate these problems you can talk about connectivity you can also talk about neel kranti which is envisaged as a port led development program in india you can also talk about uh, the limited number of vessels that we have you can also talk about sedimentation sedimentation bahut hone ki wajah se depth zyada nahi hai river waters ka aur depth zyada na hone ke karan bigger vessels cannot ply between different ports okay so you can talk about all these things you can also talk about the shortage of water because some areas receive lesser rainfall and since some areas receive lesser rainfall most of the rivers in india are not perennial they are ethereal and therefore monsoon plays a big role and because of 
uh, events like El Nino and other global warming events, we have irregular and erratic rainfall. Therefore, dependence on such natural, uh, national waterways becomes a problem. So, sedimentation, barraging, dredging, dams, disturbance of marine flora and fauna, all these things should be included. Once you include these things, your answer becomes complete in its own right. So, guys, we have, we have come to the end of part 2 and with this, we complete the complete overhaul and the analysis of GS paper 1 this year. I hope that this was beneficial and I hope that you will go through this. This is primarily meant for serious UPSC aspirants. Now, the next exercise would be to sit down and try to complete this paper within 3 hours. I will see you in the next edition wherein we will be discussing essay GS2, GS3 and GS4 in a similar manner. Thank you. Have a good day.